As we acknowledge the land this morning, may we be still and know that we are here in this moment, in this place, wherever we may be. Let's slow down now and ground ourselves in this moment. I invite you to pause, take a breath, feel your body held and anchored here by the force of gravity. And now we notice the land itself and feel how it's holding us and supporting us. We acknowledge that this land has been home to indigenous peoples for thousands of years. They lived here and thrived here long before European settlers came and drastically altered their lives and the life of the land. We're hosted on the lands of the Mississaugas of the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Wendat. We also recognize the enduring presence of all First Nations, Métis, and Inuit peoples. The light of Christ calls us to walk the way of the peacemaker. We walk this road one step at a time. As we discover and create this path, we listen within and we listen to those around us. The Christ light calls us to support one another as we journey. And in the face of systemic racism here in Canada and in the world, and in the face of the ways we perpetuate this, we are called to listen and learn, to challenge and change the status quo, and to allow space for others to walk their roads. May this light remind us to walk faithfully in the way of Jesus. And this light of welcome is extended to all of you Islington United is a community of people just trying their best to follow in the way of Jesus. We don't love the same, vote the same, think the same, and there's room for us to be ourselves. And in this Labor Day time, in this cusp between summer and fall, we invite you to worship, to find your way in your heart into what journey is next to come. Let's worship God together. Tempest 
hosts blow my order from your throne. While all that borrows my from you is ever in your care, and everywhere that I may be, you God are present there. And as we sing about the mighty power of God, you may be reminded of ones who have taught you about faith. When we gather for worship, we light our memorial candles and honor the cloud of witnesses, those who have gone before. And on this season of creation beginning, we honor those who have taught us to love the earth, who have taken off their shoes and spent time with us outside, who have called us to read that big book of creation as we read the stories of faith. May their lights call us to sing a song of praise to our Maker. is with us and with all creation, a passage from Psalms. May we be equipped by these words to walk in love for God, ourselves, our neighbors, all people, and all God's creation. Psalm 8. O Lord, our sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouths of babes and infants, you have founded a bulwark because of your foes to silence the enemy and the avenger. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars that you have established, 
What are human beings that you are mindful of them, mortals that you care for them? Yet you have made them a little lower than God and crowned them with glory and honor. You have given them dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under their feet, all sheep and oxen, and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the air, and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the seas. O Lord, our sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Herein lies wisdom. Thanks be to God. Majestic is your name in all the earth. O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. O oh Lord, we praise your name. O oh Lord, we magnify your name. Prince of peace, mighty God. O oh Lord, God Almighty. How majestic is your name in all the earth. O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. O oh Lord, we praise your name. O oh Lord, we magnify your name. Prince of peace, mighty God. O oh Lord, God Almighty. A passage from Genesis chapter 2. May we be enlivened by these words to do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with God. This is the story of how it all started, of heaven and earth when they were created. At the time God made earth and heaven, before any grasses or shrubs had sprouted from the ground, God hadn't yet sent rain on earth, nor was there anyone around to work the ground. The whole earth was watered by underground springs. God formed man out of dirt from the ground and blew into his nostrils the breath of life. The man came alive, a living soul. Then God planted a garden in Eden in the east. He put the man he had just made in it. God made all kinds of trees grow from the ground, trees beautiful to look at and good to eat. The tree of life was in the middle of the garden, also the tree of knowledge of good and evil. A river flows out of Eden to water the garden, and from there divides into four rivers. The first is named Pishon. It flows through Havilah where there is gold, the gold of this land is good. The land is also known for a sweet-scented resin and the onyx stone. The second river is named Gihon. It flows through the land of Cush. The third river is named Hidekel and flows east of Assyria. The fourth river is the Euphrates. God took the man and set him down in the Garden of Eden to work the ground and keep it in order. God commanded the man, you can eat from any tree in the garden except from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Don't eat from it. The moment you eat from that tree, you're dead. God said, it's not good for the man to be alone. I'll make him a helper. A companion. So God formed from the dirt of the ground all the animals of the field 
and all the birds of the air. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them. Whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. The man named the cattle, named the birds of the air, named the wild animals, but he didn't find a suitable companion. God put the man into a deep sleep. As he slept, he removed one of his ribs and replaced it with flesh. God then used the rib that he had taken from the man to make woman and presented her to the man. The man said, finally, bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh, name her woman, for she was made from man. Therefore, a man leaves his father and mother and embraces his wife. They become one flesh. The two of them, the man and his wife, were naked, but they felt no shame. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Holy One, this morning we thank you for the creatives for the writers, specifically for the writings and work of Brian McLaren that are helping shape our year of learning and drawing closer to you, for his wisdom and ideas and his call for us to remember the words of the psalmist, that the heavens declare the glory of you, O God, the skies proclaim the work of your hands, and day after day they pour forth speech, night after night they reveal knowledge. In this day, between the words that are said and the words that are heard, may you be known. Amen. Jesus said, I have come that you should have life and have it in fullness. And in the early story of creation, the Spirit of God breathed life over the waters. Ruach, that breath of life. Isn't that what we all really want we want to be alive, to feel alive, not just to exist or survive, but to thrive, to live out loud, to walk tall, to breathe free. We want to be less lonely, less exhausted, less conflicted or afraid, more awake, more grateful, more energized and purposeful. We capture this kind of mindful overbrimming of life, seeing the cup half full as opposed to half empty in words we use like well-being, shalom, blessedness, wholeness, harmony, life to the fullest, and the sense of seeking what it means to be alive. Aliveness is a knowing. We experience it when we've had time to rest from our labors, when we strip away the busyness, when we quiet our minds, when we lay down in the grass and look up at the stars, when we put aside our roles and our demands and we remember who we are and whose we are. It's that knowing, the quest for aliveness, that may be one of the best things about faith. Before Christianity was a rich and powerful religion, before it was associated with buildings and budgets and crusades and colonialism or televangelism, it began as a revolutionary, nonviolent movement promoting a new kind of aliveness to the margins of society. It dared to honor women, children, and unmarried adults in a world ruled by married men. It dared to elevate slaves to equality with those who gave them orders. It challenged masters to free their slaves and see them as equal. It defied religious taboos that divided people into us and them, in and out, good and evil, clean and unclean. It claimed that everyone, not just the elite few, had God-given gifts to use for the common good. It exposed a system based on domination and privilege and violence, and it proclaimed in its place a vision of mutual service, of mutual responsibility, and peaceable neighborliness. How we crave to know that now. It put people above profit, 
made audacious claims that the earth belonged not to the rich or powerful, but to the creator who loves every sparrow in the trees and every wildflower in the field. It was a peace movement, a love movement, a joy movement, a justice movement, an integrity movement, an aliveness movement. More than ever, we need to remember who we've been, where we're going. To be alive is to look up at the stars on a dark night and to feel the beyond words awe of space in its vastness. To be alive is to look down from a mountaintop on a bright, clear day and feel the wonder only expressed in words like, oh, or wow, or even hallelujah. To be alive is to look out from the beach toward the horizon on a sunset or a sunrise and to savor the joy of a new beginning. To be alive is to gaze in delight at a single bird or a leaf or a tree or a friend, to feel that they whisper of a creator, of a source we all share, to notice, to put down your phone and be present in the moment. And if we want to know the original artist, if we want to pay attention to what that one who created us is like, a smart place to start would be to enjoy the art of the creator. And as part of God's creation, we stand in awe. I wonder when the last time you felt awe, wonder, heard and remembered the story of creation where on the seventh day, the creator looked back at all that was created and said, it is very good. Those words, it is good, are foundational to who we are as people of faith. But that's not the only creation story. The second one you heard read this morning, it's an account which many scholars consider to be the older one, and it describes a whole other dimension of our identity. In that account, the possibility of not good also exists. God puts the first couple in a garden that contains two special trees. The tree of life is theirs to enjoy but not the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Why do I always seem to forget in this story about the tree of life? The tree of life is a beautiful image, suggesting health, strength, thriving, fruitfulness, growth, vigor, and all we mean by aliveness. I wonder what the second tree might really signify. It's been used in so many different ways throughout the generations. But today, I want you to think about that second tree. Is it our desire to play God and judge parts of creation? All of the parts God considers good. Does it make room for us to say what's good and not good or to call some things evil? Do you see the danger? God's judging is always wise, fair, true, merciful, restorative, but our judging, it's frequently ignorant, biased, retaliatory, and devaluing. So when we judge, we inevitably misjudge. You know that breath. You know that inner dialogue of judgment whether it's turned on yourself or others, whether it lives in a state of openness or denial, it's present in all of us. So this second creation story is needed to wake us up. It presents us with our challenge as human beings. We constantly make a crucial choice. Do we eat from the tree of life? So we continue to see and value the goodness of creation and so reflect that as the living image of God. Or do we eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, constantly misjudging and playing God and as a result, mistreating our fellow creatures? It's a good and beautiful thing to be an image bearer of God. But it's also a big responsibility Bearing God's image that's imprinted in creation. 
I spent some time two weeks ago in Algonquin Park in the forest. It was a rainy adventure. We spent the day hiking. Some call it forest bathing. We were on a trail that led us to some old growth white pines, trees that have been on the planet for over 250 years, trees that knew the story of life and death, trees that when you come close to them, bear the image of creator, bearing God's image. Isn't that why we hold babies and bless them at baptism or other special moments? It's why we bless animals and gardens and backpacks and seeds. We honor people of all ages, the image of God that they bear in their work and place in the world, bearing God's image. We know that as people of faith reflected in the person of Jesus, whose life points to the tree of life. Imagine how the world would be different if we choose the tree of life. Amen. All things bright and beautiful all creatures great and small, all things wise and wonderful, the Lord God made them all. Each little flower that opens, each little bird that sings, he made their glowing colors, he made their tiny wings. Things bright and beautiful, all creatures great and small, all things wise and wonderful, the Lord God made them all. The purple headed mountain, the river running by. The sunset and the morning that brightens up the sky, the cold wind in the winter, the pleasant summer sun, the ripe fruits in the garden, he made them and beautiful, all creatures great and small, all things wise and wonderful, the Lord God made them all. He gave us eyes to see them, and lips that we might tell, how great is God Almighty. Has made all things well, all things bright and beautiful, all creatures great and small, all things wise and wonderful. The Lord. I invite you to join me now as we pray. <clears throat> Dear God, we thank you for this gift of aliveness, for making us a part of your incredible creation. Help us to be attentive to the fullness of creation and the many gifts that you offer us. Inspire us to be creative and generous with these gifts. Through awe and wonder, may we see the goodness of your creation, God, honoring your presence in all of it. 
And as we learn to honor you, help us to honor one another. Even amidst our struggles, may we honor you and one another, supporting those grieving loss, those dealing with illness and divisions. And when it's so tempting for us to divide your creation through our judgments, help us to choose the tree of life. Help us to choose wholeness. We pray that you will guide us, God, to bearing your image. For we are made in your likeness, in your aliveness, reflecting your goodness throughout creation. Give us strength and wisdom to bear your image responsibly. As we continue looking to Jesus' example, praying together in the words he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And on this Labor Day Sunday, we now look to some of the ways that the church is supporting teachers around the world. Young people here have lack of access to cultural resources, so being part of this is a very new experience. They're actually making connections with each other and learning each about each other and, and finding out that they're unique themselves and it's building up their confidence. Remember you're thinking as a large team. This program is a life skills program that teaches people to be able to recognize and, and do change. Everything that the horse does can be parallel to people in everyday life. What we do in this week is we plant the seed. We plant the seed that things can be done differently. You can do better. You can communicate better. You can actively listen. All those seeds have been planted and then every day we water them. And we water them with positive reinforcement. At first lots of us were really, really scared and like we didn't really know how to interact or what to do. We weren't taking the leadership role, and then that's one thing the horses taught us, because that if we weren't taking the leadership role, they were just gonna stand there or go do their own thing. Just watching the past few days, everyone's been building that trust in that leadership role and just making lots of improvements. It's another step towards bringing wholeness back into communities. After everything that's happened with regard to residential schools, I am so proud to be here to see young people get connected to culture, get connected to the special symbolism of their culture through horses. It's not just the effects of the residential school experience. It's also the impact of 500 years of colonialism, the loss of land, segregation on reserves, policies outlawing indigenous culture. Colonialism and institutional racism continue today. You see it in inequitable funding for education and substandard access to healthcare and other services. For healing to start, the proper resources, equitable access to services, and equality have to be in place to benefit the people. If these barriers are removed, these kids and Indigenous society will reach their full potential. The things that I learned here is uh, building trust, gaining confidence. I hope that they can take the positive, learn from their experiences with the horses, with each other and us, and continue to do some of these things in everyday life.
I give thanks for the ways that our offerings connect us to doing mission here in our local community and with the wider church. I'm also grateful for all of the ways people have been generous in supporting this ministry as we've pivoted and make room to do things in new ways. The food bank will be reopening in a new way on Wednesday, and our prayers are with the Maybell team. We bless all of the different ways that ministry is happening and being offered in Christ's name in our community. We also look forward to the finishing of construction as the German International School has begun their school year and we finish off some of the projects, particularly around the main office. So the building continues to remain closed and yet the ministry happens in so many amazing ways. You'll see me regularly uh, in the mornings on Facebook Live and on Monday evenings, not on Labor Day Monday, but for the rest, you'll be able to join James for Zoom meditation and look for the fall meditation schedule beyond that. I also want you to know if you haven't got your copy of the book, We Make the Road by Walking, those are words that have informed our worship today and will continue to inform for the next year together. We're working with a few other congregations um, in the Ontario area who are having their clergy pray together and work on resources to open for us possibilities of how we can draw closer to God. You can get that book at The Novel Spot, our local bookshop at Humbertown Plaza, or call the office if you know someone in need who could use a copy. The last thing I want to do today is honor that um, our Michelle Reese, who has been our children and family coordinator, is leaving us for the next couple of months. We are blessing her on her way to Greece, where she'll be serving in a refugee camp. As we pray her goodbye, we know that her community will also be holding her parents part of our community as they let her fly and serve. And we know that there'll be stories for us as she enters out in faith and returns to us around Christmas. She'll be with us outside. Um, I invite you to get in your car and bring your backpack or your work briefcase um, because we'll be blessing the backpacks and saying goodbye to Michelle on Thursday, uh, September 10th from 3.30 to 5.30. Turn into the front laneway and join the car procession as we um, tie a blessed backpack tag on your bag. You might have noticed that there are some here we do this as a sign of blessing that our work is God's work, however we serve in the world. And we know for parents and children and frontline workers, those leaving their homes every day, that even more they need our prayers to remind them that God is with them, not to be afraid, and that they're not alone in the learning and making this way in the world together. We do that trusting in God's goodness and the unfolding of this season of creation. And I can't think of a better way to bless us out than to sing together, How Great Thou Art. I hear the 
bird sing sweetly in the trees. When I look down from lofty mountain grandeur and hear the brook and feel the gentle breeze, then sings my soul, my Savior God, to how great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. But when I think that God his Son not smiling, Send him to die, I scarce can take it in. That on the cross, my burden gladly bearing, he bled and died to take away my sin. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art. My soul, my Savior, God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Go from this place, surrounded the, by the unconditional love of God, whose image is reflected to us in creation, and following in the way of the one who risked for love. And may the Spirit find you noticing, we make this road by walking. Go in peace. Amen.